going to, since it's a, a short, short-ish time for the talk here, I, I'll apologize in advance that I am going to have to, you know, really rush through these slides. Um, but uh, the main thing, if you know, if, if you feel like this talk went too fast, is you can look up this paper um, that we we have just now. Uh, my colleague Andrea Schlatter have just had this come out in Journal Physics Communications. And Andreas is the lead author on this paper. I have been developing the transactional formulation of quantum theory. I now call it a formulation because it is, it is not just an interpretation. It actually has some subtle different physics from the standard approach, which hopefully we'll convey at some point um, in the talk here. Um, so that's the abstract, and, and of course I should first thank the organizers very much for, for um, inviting me to give this talk and accepting this talk for presentation. It's a great honor to be among the founders of the MOND approach and the entropic gravity approach, which I think is the right way to go. And so what this talk is going to do is um, take a slightly different approach to uh, some of the work that Okay, everybody run. Um, great. Okay, so so that uh, Professor Berlin's uh, the pioneering work on entropic gravity, and um, so our work is exploring some a slightly different way of understanding what's going on in terms of the physics. So. Um, perhaps a touch of audacity here, but hopefully, maybe, this just might be the physical principle that we're all looking for, or not, you know, I don't know, you may decide, no, this is wrong, but, um, but if you, you know, if you find it convincing or, or worth looking at, it really could be the, the solution that, that's kind of getting at, well, what is the real physics here? What is giving rise to this deviation from the basic Newtonian picture in a way that doesn't involve ad hoc parameters and tweaking things, which I think our speakers so far have made, made a good case that that's not really the right way to go. That's not, that's not a good explanation of what's going on. So um, just to kind of get to, give you a heads up, now the price for this I could be breakthrough. It is giving up uh, our usual way of thinking about space-time. So we, we tend to think that that we that space-time is a container for what we call the entire universe, that the entire, that the universe, the physical universe is identified with the, what we call space-time. So this, this approach says, no, not quite, okay? Um, space-time is, is definitely important, but it's emergent. So it takes very literally, in a sense, and perhaps farther than Professor Berlin want, wanted to go um, with the idea of space-time emergence. No, it, it really does emerge. Um, it comes out of the quantum level. So the, the, uh, the idea here then is that the quantum level is physically real. It is part of the universe, but it is not part of space-time. It is literally the source of space-time. So um, just some kind of quick points to, to sort of set the stage for, for where we've been and where we're going. Um, just to repeat this, this nice quote from Professor Berlin's uh, probably 2012 paper, um, and he said, space is in the first place a device introduced to describe the positions and momenta of particles. Space is therefore literally a storage, I'm not going to say just because I think it's, it's, it's pretty important, it's, it's a storage space for information. This information is naturally associated with matter. And this approach that we're taking is a slightly different way of understanding it. Now, of course, at the quantum level, particles, or I call them quantum because I don't really think they're little hunks of hard classical stuff. They're not localized. Um, we all know the, the usual quantum issues there. So what we do is we consider the quantum level as a, as a kind of substrat for the emergence of empirical space time. So I discussed this. My work is primarily aimed at elaborating this picture. Um, and the transactional formulation is what describes how 
how those quanta in the substratum give rise to localized events that are that actually comprise the emergent empirical space time. Those events I call actualities, and I discuss that in my, my latest um, book. So, so that invariant, uh, so that empirical space time is really, and this, uh, this I think was Einstein, Einstein's concept, an invariant set of actualized events. They are capable of a covariant description in terms of the Lorentzian manifold. But the manifold that we're using, you know, with the coordinatizations that we use, is not to be identified with the ontological space-time construct, which is simply those invariant events and their connections and their structural connections. So um, as Verlin showed, quantifying the entropy cost of localization, and, well, that's, this isn't perhaps the way he initially presented it, but this is the way we, we are presenting that quantifying the entropy cost of localization relative to some inertial frame quantifies the so-called gravitational force. Okay, because we know it's not really a real force. Um, all right, so here's just a quick um, little animation that, you know, hopefully won't insult your intelligence, but just to kind of give you a picture of, of what this looks like. Other events in the past, but on quantum scales, Processes occur outside of space time in a realm we call quantum land. In quantum land, interactions are not linear sequences of events. They challenge our usual notions of cause and effect. At a quantum level, emitters and absorbers are always aware of each other through forces. Under suitable conditions, they may take their interaction to the next level. When this happens, the emitter and absorbers reach out to exchange energy in a quantum handshake. These are possibilities. When one of the possibilities is actualized, the event happens in space-time, not quantum land. Okay. So I want to just stop there for a second because this corresponds to uh, localization of the quanta that are involved, which establishes space-time events. And this is an entropy-reducing process because you're, you're you know, in the usual parlance, um, erasing information. You you were going from a, a, a circumstance of many possibilities to one actuality. One absorber can shake hands with the emitter. That means the winning absorber receives a photon from the emitter. These real handshakes, or actualized transactions, establish the elements of time and space. Space time is created from the possibilities of quantum land. Okay, so. So in this yeah. picture, um, and see now the eventual result. Right. Um, it keeps wanting to. Yeah. Okay. So um, in this picture, um, the quantum level really is. It does have entropy, and the entropy is quantifying those possibilities. So that when we have space-time emergence, in effect, we have a reduction of entropy that comes with an entropy cost. So we're going to explore that uh, ramifications. And here I'm just kind of um, re reiterating, I guess, what we said before, but just kind of pointing out that the holographic principle gains a new interpretation in this picture. Because the holographic screen can be thought of as the boundary between the quantum substratum and the newly emergent region of space-time. And of course, you know, you use language like region. I don't literally mean a hunk of, you know, space-time. I mean that the kind of description we would give of a certain set of events. Okay, so, uh, so just to go briefly over, very quickly over the points that I want to try to highlight very quickly here. Um, in this paper, we show that transactions are the physical basis of the entropic force, which is used in Verlin 2011 and his other papers, to derive Newtonian gravity. Uh, our approach yields the effective unreal, unreal rate acceleration. So in other words, we're not going to just take that for granted. We actually show how it comes out of physics. Uh, the photons exchanged in transactions can serve as clocks that are naturally inbuilt to the emergent sets of events. And the gauging of these clocks most generally leads to Einstein's equations on a Lorentz manifold. So uh, in addition, photon exchange leads to the cosmological lambda term corresponding to so-called dark energy, with a different, having a different physical origin than the vacuum energy that is presumed in standard 
and standard quantum field theory. In the transactional picture, there's no the vacuum does not really have infinite energy, which is nice because you don't want the vacuum to have infinite energy. Um, specifically, lambda arises from the effective radiation pressure of transferred photons, which drives the expansion. And the synchronization of these light clocks from perspectives of different observers further leads to the bond correction of Newtonian gravity as calculated in, in Milgram's works. So here I'm just going to go quickly through um, what you've probably already seen before, but just with a slightly different interpretation. In the transactional picture, you can, uh, you can assign uh, a basic information content to hypothetical localization dictated by a particular point, even though that's an idealization. We don't, we don't think there are really points of space-time. But you can, you can do this, and we show in the paper how the most general consideration of averaging over all possible probabilities and, and, and states and so forth will give you basically you know, a one half of entropy per bit. And then when you take into account that when you're localizing a real physical system, it's not going to be localized beyond a Planck volume. You get this extra factor of 2 pi. So that the, the entropy per bit is 2 pi times the Boltzmann constant. So um, that, the way this works, and again, this is just a, an, an, a review of, of Verlin's presentation, but from a transactional picture, we can think of this sphere in, in closing a, a source mass, a, a large mass that's much smaller than a test mass. Um, let me get my here. So, okay, so we have our source mass and then and the test mass. And when we, uh, we can assign an entropy content to the bits associated with that source mass, and they're basically the same way that, that Berlin does, it's proportional to the area. And so the total area for a particular sphere dictated by the radius r is, is given by this expression. Okay. And now you can define a formal temperature that's a function of m and r in terms of the energy terms of the thermodynamic relation. So we, we do that, we get our, our temperature, and then this just defines the acceleration unit gravity. So this is a temperature, the temperature as a function of the source mass and an average of degree radius. So now in the transactional picture, we get, again have these, that it was, it was believable. I think it's never actually been proven. Uh, it's usually circular where we say, well, we know the second law holds. Uh, so we're going to say that, you know, you've got to pay an entropic price. But um, in any case, you, you're going to have this restoring force that, that points back towards the source. And you can calculate the effective work uh, due to that force. And when you do that, you get the, basically the force of gravity. Okay, so using the temperature. So, so the, the idea here is that we are arriving at this result by uh, taking into account that that this transactional localization is, is reducing the entropy of the system and, and it's going to go back towards equilibrium and that's the gravitational force. Now I don't have much time here, so I'm going to kind of speed through a lot of this um, content here. But the point, the next point we want to make is that we can think of transactions and in a thermal environment as um, embodying this thermal clock. And the, th the thermal clock notion is, is not really new. It's been explored by uh, Margolis, Leviton, and, and Rebelli and his colleagues. But we have a basic um, time, okay, basic time interval that's universal over all, all kinds of systems that just dependent on temperature. Um, that it that defines how what is the time, average time that it takes to change the state. So that uh, is a good unit to use in which to measure the proper time. And if we do that, we get what's called a thermal time, which is basically the speed of actualization um, that expresses the, the temperature also as kind of defining how fast things are getting actualized, how fast the, the rate at which space time is. 
And uh, now we're looking at a Riddler frame here. We're taking into account that you know uh, the, that a proper acceleration really means that uh, you you are being acted on. You're being pushed off your GFDC, and that a Riddler observer is experiencing what they think of as the gravitational force, um, but they're actually uh, being pushed off their geodesic, and that's why they feel this gravitational field. But the, the effective clock, or thermal clock, that they're going to be, um, that's going to characterize their situation is defined, again, by that source mass. And what, what we're doing now is recognizing that the, the thermal clock is properly gauged by photons, because that's the actual generator of this set of events and its associated curvature. So this velocity, we multiply, we manipulate this equation to get a velocity. And if we identify this velocity with the speed of light, then we get this, this expression, which gives you the unroot temperature. So that's like a fundamental way of, of seeing where does this unroot temperature come from. It comes from noting that the uh, thermal clock is really a light clock in Einstein's sense. So um, this is a way to extract Einstein's equations, which I'm not going to go through now. But the basic starting point is to just look at this uh, unroot acceleration in this fundamental uh, um, thermodynamic relation. And interpret this as, as your acceleration of your volume, the area, uh, the, the area on the left-hand side. And then just using the definitions of the energy momentum, momentum tensor, zeroth component, and of the Ricci tensor, you can just extract that basic form of the Einstein equation. And then the other crucial point I should just you know, throw in here as my time runs out, is that we're getting the cosmological constant from the photon momentum. Because again, this is how space-time is getting uh, generated is through the transfers of these photons. And they have a pressure related to uh, their momentum. And th this is the rate that at which transactions are occurring. You can define this pressure. And you can use that to define lambda. And then you have your lambda term. And then taking into account the general transformations, you get the Einstein equation. So finally, um, we can get the bond parameter out of the de Sitter space horizon and the, the horizon acceleration. And this is related to the lambda we just got. Um, then you can define your de Sitter entropy. And this will also, now we're going to make use of what uh, Professor Berlin was just referring to in terms of the amount by which adding a mass reduces the entropy. And by using that, uh, that relation and, and requiring that the, uh, an observer that is only subject to uh, the gravitational force, so in fact, like the right hand side here, is, is describing the point of view of, of an observer who's, who's in a state of co-moving with the so-called vacuum expansion, and that this is the observer who is, who is not and who is seeing both the vacuum expansion and the gravitational force. And their accounts must uh, must agree. So this is the constraint that uh, this consistency condition that evaluating it leads to this expression for the bond parameter. And if you work that out, you get um, you know various results here that correspond to the the original bond parameter as proposed by Milgram and we find a, a critical radius by demanding that this left-hand side be meaningful, that that difference, uh, that, that, that the left-hand side be non-zero, taking into account the, uh, the existence of mass. And so this, uh, this gives you, in effect, your critical so for radii larger than the critical radius, the vacuum expansion dominates, as we see with the 
galaxy phenomena. And then for smaller r, the Newtonian gravity dominates. Now consistency checks, and I'm probably out of time. So just very quickly conclusions. Um, as proposed by Berlin, gravitation is an entropic force describing the approach of the total system to an equilibrium condition. We can give an account of the physics of this process in terms of the transactional formulation, uh, with, which has the non-unitary photon transfer. The quantum level comprises possibilities for localization. Entropy quantifies those possibilities, and transactions affect localization. They make information available, and, and they establish space-time events. Then the entropy cost of that localization relative to a local inertial frame is the force of gravity. So um, just further observations that transactions are the basis of thermal time or the flow of actualization. Thus, defining a thermal clock gauged by the speed of light yields the metric structure of space-time and validates Einstein's clock hypothesis. Photon transfer also yields the cosmological constant of a correct value, reflecting the expansion of space-time itself. And the bond correction is derived through consistency of thermal clocks among observers co-moving with the vacuum expansion, uh, seeing only gravitation, and observers seeing both expansion and gravitation. So if you want the references, if you don't believe what I've said, you know, happy to give me appropriate references. So thank you very much. It's a little bit stigmatized because Wheeler and Feynman, you know, they developed it and then they walked away from it. And you kind of go, you know, these two smart guys abandoned their, their theory. It must not be any good. But it's, there's a reason why they abandoned it, even though it, it's great. It, it, it works. I'm sorry. Did somebody have a question? Or I was, oh, I'm sorry. I, was just, I didn't know you had a question. I thought everyone was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I have a couple of questions related to like uh, the uh, empirical sort of tests of, of this idea. So first of all, like um, when you were saying on the last slide about the prediction for how much the lambda should be, uh, did I understand correctly you could predict the amount of dark energy that the universe should have? It gives um, a prediction of the right order. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think there's a lot of, again, I'm not at all an expert in in cosmology or astronomy, so I do, I'm not up on what the latest you know work is and, and data on that. Well, and I mean, as know, opposed to the, the hugely inappropriate quantum field theory vacuum energy, it's no, nothing like that. It gives you the know, right order of magnitude. Yeah. That, that's good because um, one couldn't expect the theory to work exactly here because the universe is not big, dominated by dark, dark energy in any case. Um, but the other thing I was uh, wanting to ask is regarding the prediction for like the value of A0. Did you look into like what value is predicted for A0 in terms of the other variables, uh, speed of light, gravity, and constant um, and so on? Because uh, on the last slide you had it in terms of A0, but the yes. slide before didn't you have A0. So here there's A0, but the slide before didn't have it, right? So the, um, the value of A0 that we Use yes. is basically one half the um, the acceleration of the the Sitter horizon. You mean C A zero over two? Yeah. I'm, uh, correct. Or a well a infinity if whatever you know that's our notation is. Is the A infinity is, in a, is the acceleration of? Oh, the I see. No, I see. You stated that A yeah. zero is C A zero. Okay. So that defines. Yeah. Right, I see. So th th this is slightly off, but it's certainly within an order of magnitude. The correct coefficient is about 0.18 instead of 0.5, um, but uh, that's reasonably close. Um, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in this field, so I... No, I'm, I'm observ observationally, it, it, it's 0.18. Um, but, uh, okay, okay I, I'll, let, thank you. Okay. I'll let other people ask, ask questions. Keith Horn. 
Um, you're talking about the transactions that's being carried by photons, which are spin one particles that have two polarizations. Do you really require that, or do you just need something that goes at the speed of light? Um, well, I, it's not so much requiring it. It's a natural um, implication of taking the electromagnetic field behavior as being dictated by the direct action picture. And that's actually what gives you this whole uh, ability to explain what measurement is. is Would it so apply to neutrinos then, which aren't charged? Um, neutrinos would certainly influence, um, I mean, I, I mean what, what would it be here in your question? What, the whole what's picture. It? So neutrinos yeah, the, the properties of neutrinos in terms of gravitating would be, um, so this is always, you know, the question, what about a neutral particle? Is that your basic concern? So, Again, we have neutral particles making up uh, composite objects and so on. And we're dealing with fermionic matter. So to the extent, and neutrinos are very weakly interacting. So what I would say is whatever the standard physics tells us about the way in which neutrinos interact with other quanta, um, would, would tell us to what extent neutrinos are going to be involved in a transactional process. And they may be, they're very, very weakly interacting. So it's a question of whether their interactions are going to become a significant part of a transactional process. To the extent that anyone, well, if you, you know, if someone goes and does a neutrino experiment where they say, okay, I have evidence of neutrinos, then, there, then it implies that the neutrinos have weakly interacted with the other quanta available in the apparatus that would allow you to get a result like that. So, I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't view this as, oh, you know, not all particles are charged, therefore this can't work. Because we do have bound states, and in fact, the only reason you get a transaction at all is because we have composite bound states that are capable of internal energy level differences, so they can tra transition from one energy level to another. So if, if a neutrino can transition from one energy level to another in some interaction, then it can participate in transaction. I may not understand what you've said, but I am under the impression that you do assume space-time where a photon is or a neutrino is or a particle is and from this you want to build the space-time so you assume what you want to build well well no that's actually not correct i mean if you read uh i would refer you to my publications the um the process in which we you know that i showed on that little animation <coughs> is is a process that occurs among quanta that are not in space-time because they're this actually you know if you look at general relativity the source of the field which is space-time is outside the field so gen standard general relativity itself actually implies that that fermionic sources are not in space-time we never noticed that but that's what it that's what it implies because the curvature doesn't doesn't vanish anymore. So, so I'm just say, taking that literally, and, and as far as photons go, they are the part of the emergent process. So the photons that, that are ultimately transferred in this transactional process are the structural connections of space-time. But they don't, they're not living in it prior to creating it, and I don't need to assume that, and I don't assume that. So photon that hits a detector is not in space-time. The event of the, the detector firing is a space-time event. Right. Correct. So the photon is in space-time. A photon is a structural property of space-time. It's a null interval that connects an emission and an absorption event. And it is a structural property of the invariant structured set of events. So, so it doesn't mean that one has to have a container first 
in which these things happen. It, it's, it's as if, you know, um, uh, if, if a tree is going to grow, I don't have to have a tree first for the tree to grow into. I mean, I, I know we, we all, you know, it's, we all look around and it's like, it's so obvious we are in space time. It's an observational fact, right? It's, it's as much an observational fact as the sun goes around the earth. I literally see the sun going around. It's an observational fact. And so, yes, it sounds crazy, but, you know, what looks like an observational fact is not always the kind of fact we thought it was, and it's something we need to re-examine. But I, I don't think, you know, I, I, I mean, I understand your concern, but I, don't, I really don't think it's accurate. I, I'm definitely not assuming a space-time container a priori. I'm saying that, that there are processes that happen, processes don't need to have a space-time in order for them to happen in. Okay, thank you. So, you just emphasized the role of fermionic bond states or something like that for the whole transaction thing being possible, be it photons on pieces of everything each exchange. I wonder. Sorry, can you speak up just a little bit? Oh, sorry. Okay. So, you just emphasized the role of something like fermionic bond states, which are play a central role in this transactional picture. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you go back very early in the universe, before the bound states, before the very even photons, before electric symmetry breaking or whatever, would you then say that space time would not have emerged by then or something like that? Yes, I mean if if there are no transactions, if there are no real photons that are created through this process, then we don't have any space time events. That doesn't mean we don't have a universe. Because so, again, it's like the tip of the iceberg, right? You still have And then, a could you still explain lambda in this very early universe? Or would that be a completely different story then? I'm sorry. I'm so the dark energy would still, in conventional picture, lambda, the dark energy, would still be present in this very early universe without transactions. Well, in, in our proposal, since lambda comes out of the momentum of trans transferred photons, in, in our picture would imply that that dark energy is not something that that exists apart from transactions occurring. So they are it's a, so so there's no such you know in our picture there's no such thing. The term dark energy is an ad hoc substance created to cover up an anomaly in this standard. So there's no such thing in, you know in our view. But there is this physics that is creating. Uh, the expansion, or what we call vacuum expansion, of the space-time construct. But that's a property of the emergent space-time. It's not a property of the underlying uh, quanta, if you will. Uh, I'm wondering about the dark energy. I mean, dark energy was introduced in physics very recently. So I wonder if somehow it would be demonstrated that dark energy doesn't exist after all. How would, how would that affect your theory? Well, I mean, our theory has lambda in it. Our theory does, does come up with, does produce a, a prediction for the cosmological constant. Um, and so, uh, the term dark energy just is a, is a is sort of another superfluous term to correspond to the cosmological constant. But since we do have that, and we we observationally see the effects attributed to lambda, our theory is consistent with observation. It's simply the term dark energy that we feel is inappropriate. So I'm not sure that answers. Okay, well, I think there's a lot to discuss over our coffee. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you.